talk to you a little bit more about them and their connection to agriculture too. To my immediate uh, right, to your left, is uh, Representative Dave Considine. He lives up in the Baraboo area. He's part of the uh, very influential uh, Dairy Goat Caucus in the building. He was a dairy uh, goat farmer. Uh, I think there's probably maybe two members of this caucus. And there's, uh, Representative Loudenbeck's nephew is a goat dairyman too, so I think that's about the extent of it, but we're glad that he's here to join us. Um, and again, he'll be able to tell you a bit more about himself. Then we have Senator Smith. Uh, Senator Smith is the new senator from the Eau Claire area. Um, he lives on a farm up in that air part of the state. Um, he was uh, formerly in the state assembly and also uh, has a, been very active in a lot of different activist groups in the Eau Claire area for a number of years. Then we have Senator Petrusky. Uh, he is vice chair of Senate Agriculture. The chairman of Senate Agriculture is a man named Howard Markline. Howard Markline's also on joint finance, and as you already heard, joint finances in the suburbs of Milwaukee today. So we're very uh, grateful that Senator Petrusky is uh, filling that position. Also, he, uh, you know, Howard's a great guy, but he's just an accountant. Uh, <laughs> Jerry actually is farmed by God. Yeah. Uh, Jerry's farmed by God and, and multiple different commodities. So he's farmed ginseng, he's, he's done some dairying, he's done beef cattle. So he has a, a lot of ag background too, and also happens to be the chair of the uh, Senate Transportation Committee. So uh, has a lot of experience on how sort of transportation and agriculture intersect. Uh, and then finally, we have uh, Gary Tauken, who's known to most of you. He's a dairy farmer and the chair of the Assembly Ag Committee. Uh, and uh, the fun fact I learned about Gary in reading your bio, at least, and to prepare for my remarks, is that you were born in Rice Lake. And who knew? <laughs> I was a senior Bondwell guy, born bred, but born in Rice Lake, transplanted to Bondwell. Uh, but now we'll get started. We'll, I'll start some questions, but then we'll open up to the group as well. Um, but first, I was hoping these guys could all just introduce themselves the, uh, with a little bit more detail, also their connection to agriculture. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm. Uh, <clears throat> I farmed full time for 20 years. Um, milked 140 head of goats. I ran an apple orchard, 14 acres, marketed all those apples on the farm, had 70 ewes, um, and did all the cropping on 160 acres of farm, and that rented a little bit of land. So lots, I still live on the farm. Uh, it runs across the top of the Baraboo Bluffs, uh, and I'm saying across the top because uh, the lowest part of my farm is still uh, two or three hundred feet above the level of Highway 33, and it's all contour strips, and if you, uh, fairly steep, the biggest field, it's, I have 70 fields in that 160 acres, and um, <laughs> the biggest of them is six, the next biggest is two and a half, and then it goes below two. So it's pretty tough to do that with modern farming, and so it's in conservation reserve program, and in the bee pollination habitat, because I really, think we need to be encouraging bees for your sake and everybody else's as well. Taught school full time for 30 years concurrently with some of that. <coughs> Students that are labeled special needs have five kids that live in Wisconsin and 11 grandchildren and you're right, uh, still have a brother farming dairy goats full time and a number of other siblings that are doing dairy goats in other parts of the nation. To say that I live on a farm is kind of a stretch. I have 40 acres. Uh, my experience around farming is I have a steer and a, some horses and some llamas and some chickens and some goats, but it's all, it's, it's not for sale. Um, so my experience, my best experience is that I have lived on this property for 33 years and, and surrounded by farms and, and gotten very familiar and very sympathetic to the farming industry um, in my area. And so, especially, particularly, I get to go, I, I love going to auctions where I really get to learn um, from people who really know and spend a lifetime around farms and, and I ask a lot of questions. So, uh, my actual business experience in my lifetime has been as a window cleaner and running a window cleaning business in our area. So, I, my father was, uh, was started this business in the 50s and, and I bought it from him in the 80s. and. Uh, and grew it from a two-man operation to 22 employees and gave me the opportunity to become more active in my community 
and try to, to make a difference uh, for all of us and for all of our children because that's what we're all here for. So um, I'm glad, I'm actually glad to be here and I really am especially proud to be um, a ranking member in agriculture for our caucus because I, um, I just, this is such an important um, industry for our state and is certainly in a crisis period of time and I hopefully that we can make a difference, bring things back. Thanks, Jeff. I, uh, I'm Jerry Petrusky. I chair the Transportation Committee, but I'm the Vice Chair of Agriculture. I, uh, I heard the comments about goats and I had to smile because I've never had any goats except the car that I used to drive. It was a GTO. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you that are a little bit older, you probably remember those years. I took somewhat of a different route to get to the farm. I had uncles that farm. I spent time on their farm during the summer. And in my 20s, I decided I was going to go from a city kid to be a farmer. And so first came enough, came 40 acres, and uh, I grew ginseng. Uh, that was my intention the first year. I ended up raising steers. I raised ginseng. I ended up buying another farm. I dairied for about eight years. At one time, we had 470 head of cattle. Not dairy cattle, but beef, young stock, whatever. I can tell you that the best part for me farming for 30 years was it was a great place to raise my four children. And they always had work to do. And, uh, you know, I think the fact that they all have a college degree and they're all working and they all make a lot more money than me, my prayers are answered. <laughs> Uh, agriculture is such an important part of our economy here in Wisconsin. Probably 25% of our economy, of our jobs, and everything else. And I know that we are going through a very difficult time for farmers. Price of milk, corn, beans. Uh, we've always been used to having swings, uh, but it seems like it's a sustained low price right now. And that needs to you know, we need to focus on that in whatever we can do. And part of it is going to be new marketplaces. Part of it is going to be technology. Looking for new ways, technology, to help reduce costs and everything else. There are no easy answers in agriculture. There's never been any easy answers. Uh, yes, do we have things that also need to be worked done? Whether it's water quality, whether it's environment. Uh, and there are some things we can do. I've been around long enough to been part of the use value. Uh, if you want to blame somebody for the uh, the uh, the road limits for agriculture, the addressing of equipment, the width, the lighting, and all that, I'm the guy to blame because it had to come through my committee. It had to come through me. It was my bill. And I want to thank you as part of that because it would not have happened if we couldn't unite the 22 groups that were part of that. And I don't even hear about anything about it anymore because I think we got it right and I think everybody contributed to making it work, including all of you. I, uh, I look forward to hearing what you have to say today. Uh, we can talk about a whole array of things. Uh, we just got done uh, introducing the bill to deal with phosphorus credits. And I think that is going to be an answer for many things, not just phosphorus, but for other things, whether it's nitrates or whatever. Uh, again, nothing simple. And one of the reasons that I think it's so important, you know, is the bill perfect? I'm sure that somebody here won't think so. But the problem is, do we wait another 20 years till we feel that we have something that's perfect? We need to start moving that agenda forward. It's just like everything else we do. We need to move things forward in a positive fashion. And if we're all pulling in the same direction, that will happen. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Well, my name's Gary Talkin, and uh, as uh, John mentioned, I'm chair of the Agricultural Committee. But uh, as far as background, I grew up on a small, um, small farm. My folks had 10 kids. They wanted us to learn responsibility and work ethic and all those fun things. So uh, we had a farm about uh, Evelyn. 
I, well, some of it. <laughs> uh, but it was, uh, we had a farm about a half mile south of Shadow Lake, and uh, we did, like uh, many of the people here, we had uh, about 100 dairy heifers um, and 50 beef and um, chickens and 100 hogs, and uh, my folks just wanted us to learn uh, as much as we could about responsibility, and they didn't want us running around, and we didn't have time to do that. So, um, so that's how I grew up, and then in 1976, my brother Alan wanted to farm, and so uh, my folks bought the farm, it happened to be the same year I graduated from college, and uh, that was, uh, I didn't think I'd have that opportunity, because I didn't know uh, anybody else from my family was <coughs> in, in farming, and it worked out really well, because I came home, uh, and uh, in 1996, so 20 years later, we uh, decided we had the place paid for, but if we would have been using a cruel accounting, we were going backwards. We had too many people involved in the dairy. So uh, we traveled around the country. I sent, we sent one brother to uh, Michigan and New York for a week each. Uh, my brother Alan traveled around uh, the uh, state of Wisconsin in 1993. The expansion started here, and so, uh, and then I was on the National DHI board, so I was traveling all over the country, and um, and then we came together in 96, we went up to 500 cows, in 2000 we doubled to 1,000, and a few years ago we went to 1,200, that's where we're at now, and we're on 2,500 acres, so um, I'm very passionate about agriculture, I guess. I farmed all my life, served on tons of boards of directors, I think uh, I was one of the founding board members, of professional dairy producers, uh, Cooperative Resources International, and Wisconsin Livestock ID Consortium, and uh, I was uh, I was talking to Dave Ward this morning, and uh, DBA's first meeting. Tim, we had uh, meeting of people at Tim Griswold's place, who was the chair of 20, Dairy Twenty Twenty at the time, and Ed Larson and I and uh, Dave Ward and. Jim Ostrom and John Breeze and several other people were there and that's where it all came from. So it's kind of cool to be here talking to you about uh, an organization that makes a tremendous impact on our industry. So I'm um, so, um, enthused, looking forward to the conversation and hopefully uh, we can have some give and take and uh, we can learn and uh, you can hear what is happening right now in the legislature. So. We'll open it up to questions, I guess. So if anyone has a question to start, please go ahead. If not, I have some questions to get the ball rolling, too. <coughs> uh, some of you mentioned in your, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jim. Well, I'd like to ask Jerry my economic question on the rural uh, roads. Jim, can you say uh, uh, who Jim you are? Jim like I'm a dairy farmer in Barron County. I uh, went to a town board meeting for another uh, dairy farmer in Barron County. He's working on uh, implementing uh, manure pipelines and so forth to get trucks off the roads. Uh, the township, Stanfield Township, about 64 miles of roads. If we were to repair the roads annually, I'm looking at how do we get some revenue to do these things in these townships. 64 miles of roads, if we replace them or repair them every 20 years, uh, that means we need to do about uh, 3.2 miles of road a year. It costs us $100,000, $150,000 a year. Or to, to do that per mile is $480,000. The township has some revenue. So let's say that 60 or 70% of the revenue needs to come from a new source. And uh, there's approximately 15, 20 townships in the county. And there's 72 counties. $483 million a year is needed to replace the roads in the township every 20 years. How do we get there? Right now we're pitting town residents against dairy farmers, crop farmers, turkey farmers, because there's this frustration about who uses the roads, who beats them up, versus who pays for them. Um, you know that in our statutes, if you do the damage on the road, you have to fix it. The question you're answering how we get more money in transportation and it isn't as easy as you might think because to get something through the legislature you have to get the votes for it or you have to find votes. Transportation funding the problem we're having didn't start overnight. The problem that we have right now 
is that we're carrying too much debt. We're carrying close to $5 billion. It comes up to about 20 cents out of every dollar that comes into trans is going for debt service. About half of that is interest and half of it is principal. So a number of years ago, we did the market interchange. The interstate system had life expectancy of 50 to 60 years. It came to be a problem that we had to do it when we did it because there were chunks of concrete is, you know, three, four feet in diameter that were falling off the bottom of it. So it needed to happen, it needed to happen then. We didn't have the cash, so we went ahead and we borrowed, bonded for it. Again, with the zoo interchange and many of the other things. Uh, when we went through the era in the 2000, uh, we had a governor that liked to take the money out of transportation to use it for other things. That's when we lost the indexing, which has caused a problem. We lost, since 2006, um, about eight and a half, nine cents uh, of gas tax that we would have gotten under indexing. That equates to $66 million per cent per biennium. So that's a lot of money. To your local question, is we need to increase the road aids. Right now, if you're a small town, up to 5,000 people, you get a stipend of exactly 22 something, $2,300 per acre. Now, we did increase that going back. We put in uh, an 8% increase there. We put in a couple years before that a 4% increase. We also increased the LRIP programs, local road improvement program, by 12%. But it isn't enough because the roads are deteriorating faster than the dollars can repair them. And it's like if you have a house and you don't fix the roof when it's leaking, uh, guess what? Pretty soon you're going to have structural damage. It's going to cost you more. If you don't have money to do the maintenance, you certainly aren't going to have enough money to reconstruct. This isn't a, a simple question that you're a asking. Um, do I think they need more money? Yes. I think we probably need a, a huge increase in transportation aids. Along with that stipend per mile, the larger towns and the villages and the cities, they get a percentage of cost. And I think there is a problem there too, because the way that formula works is that if you <coughs> spend more money, invest more money in transportation, you get more. And when you have that same sum certain coming out of that one kettle, and it also takes care of the needs of Milwaukee, plus the needs of small communities in your district, uh, it isn't fair. So under the road aids, you probably have been getting less if you're a village or a city or a large town. So those are some of the things I'd like to work on. You mentioned the thing about pumping manure. Uh, I was one of the authors of that, of that bill too, because it will take that heavy equipment off of the roadway. I know that the farmers, when it comes spring and they need to plant, they need to be on the road moving their equipment. And we've worked with local governments trying to get there. Uh, I think everybody is aware that we need more money in transportation. Now, how we're going to get there? And I think there's a, about five years ago, I put together a small panel of senators that were looking for ways to improve the transportation. And we came up with a three pages of ideas. Um, some of them were heavy truck uh, increases in their permitting. Uh, some of the uh, trade-in issues with counting the sales tax, some of it shifting sales tax for auto and auto-related parts into transportation. Um, the license that you carry in your pocket is $4 a year. Um, some of these are smaller, some of them will make a huge difference. But regardless of how you look at it, we need to do something about the debt that we're carrying, and we need to do something about getting an increase for local road aids. Yeah, what else like that? And, you know, transportation. Well, I, I just I think uh, Jerry did a really good job of uh, explaining some of these things because the 20 percent of debt that we are now paying out of transportation is really a good example of the politics that we're up against because that was closer to seven percent only you know I don't know like 15 years ago or something like that. So we keep building on that and borrowing instead of instead of actually fixing the problem. We've got to we've got we need politicians with the backbone to just say, 
uh, enough with the headlines, enough with the politics, enough with the campaigning, and let's actually fix the problem. And one of the fixes I'd like to see, which actually addresses a lot of things locally, is to lift the caps of what we have on local government and let them start making decisions <coughs> that are best suited for their constituency in their towns and their in their counties and their in their uh, school districts and those sorts of things. So I, I'd like to see us give them more ability to do the things they need to do. The one, the one thing that's important, we need long-term sustainability and viability in the transportation fund. And, and what that includes, uh, you know, it could be a, a combination of a lot of different things. And, uh, but the, the goal has to be that we are functioning and moving the state forward, that we're not continuing to go deeper in debt. So regarding transportation, is the state looking at other ways of funding transportation? And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, not funding, but um, doing transportation, meaning going to more long-term, you don't just build a road, but you've got to maintain it for seven years. It's you know, actions like that. Are, are we rethinking transportation beyond just where's the money coming from? Because that's a, a universal issue in the country. Yeah, well, there's a number of things. Uh, of course, uh, a lot of the road builders, including the university, are looking at ways to uh, combine new products and whatever to make the roads last longer. Every road that you drive on has a maintenance schedule. The time when you deal with you know, seal coating, resurfacing, whatever. You can take a 30-year road and make it last 70 years if you do all the maintenance that you're supposed to do on time. If you want to start getting to a problem where moisture gets under it and it starts heaving up, there too, there are some roads in the state that when they were built originally, there was actually logs under the roads. And so we do some resurfacing, and sure as hell, within five years, we've got the same problem back again. And I've told DOT that on these certain roads that they should dig out those places, put in a solid base, at least then we don't have to come back with the same thing over and over again. And I think, you know, we're gonna do more and more of that uh, we've done some audits of the department. We've done a lot of things to save money. And were they good? Yes. But bottom line, we still need more money in transportation. I've sat down with one road builder who, would, who really wants us to look at, um, in the DOT, to, to work with them on their process of recycling as well. Grounding up what we have and, re, and right on the spot, right on site. Saves, it can save millions of dollars on projects and reuse that. Unfortunately, too often the DOT is telling them, no, you need virgin material. That's, that can be a problem, too. So yeah. we'd like to save money that way. And on projects, some of it is being recycled and used. I think it's like 30%. You use a variety of uh, techniques to develop metrics for determining who uh, is going to be the, uh, the person that gets the bid, or are you operating from the state level where you try to get just the lowest cost? I mean, do you look at other metrics in terms of evaluating the quality of the work that some of the road builders would do, or how do you look at that? Because that's one thing to consider, I would think, in terms of longevity of the roads, the quality aspects. Well, I, I think what we're looking at now is a lot of projects that we bid, we only have one bidder. And I think that leads to a problem. Well, why is that, only one bidder? I mean, because it's always the lowest cost one, and the other one just opt out? <coughs> I, I think uh, there maybe isn't with <coughs> projects, maybe there isn't enough companies around that are willing to take on that size or proportion, or a lot of them have been booked up on uh, other projects that they're doing someplace in the state, and some of them have gone out of state looking for more work also. There are, are some other things that we can do uh, within the bidding process. Uh, there's something called Trans 220. And that really opens the door for more cost also. So that's something else that I want to look at this year to see if we can't fix. And it's trying to get everybody that's doing part of that project, whether it be utility corridors and the road builders working together so that nobody is standing around. So it's a <coughs> flowing operation where you can uh, do it the cheapest and the best. But sometimes the uh, project's got to come to a halt here and move everything down the road three miles because there's a utility corridor crossing and they have to deal with that. 
when you heard in your opening remarks about some references to low commodity prices and sort of the state of the farm com economy right now, um, some of those issues are caused by <coughs> things beyond our control. Some things are we could have to get some help from some federal uh, programs and more access to new foreign markets. That maybe isn't something that the state can always work on. What are some things the state can provide you to help? What do you see as the role of your committee and, and you as a legislator to try to help uh, both the dairy folks and other people struggling with low commodity prices? I think we need to um, be looking at encouraging exports and that gap and maybe even new products. One of the suggestions that uh, I've been hearing recently is the Asian market that is wide open for cheese exports to a certain extent and maybe we need to do some specialized marketing and understanding of what kinds of cheeses they may purchase because I think that's a we export nothing there um, and I think there's some real possibility for some expansion in, in that particular part of exports for, for the surplus um, and then I just think it's encouraging farmers to diversify uh, to not have all their eggs in one basket. It's one of the reasons that I've been pushing industrial hemp. And we just had a press conference on that just before I came came here. To, um, and there's a lot of excitement about that by people who are dairy farmers who are saying, I'm gonna try this for a little bit and see what happens here. Um, and so I think we need to encourage that in our whole agricultural industry as well. We've become really specialized and I think we're doing really well at being specialized, but there is strength in diversification. It, Two of us mentioned that when we were younger and farming, there was a lot of diversification in farms, and there's not as much anymore. And I think, to a certain extent, we're learning maybe we need to have some of that diversification. Uh, so maybe encouraging that can be helpful as well. Yeah, it's sort of a built-in hedging mechanism. Right, so exactly. Yeah. Any other comments from yeah. everyone that? Go ahead, Gary. Well, you know, I'm speaking to the choir here, but we have an $88 billion business. The good part, and we only have about four to five percent of the world's population that lives here, so what Dave said is absolutely correct. Um, trade is very important. We have cheese that uh, 90 percent of the milk that is made in the state of Wisconsin goes into cheese, and 90 percent of it is exported out of the state. So, um, so trade is a big part of the answer long term. The problem is that, you know, we know that for the last five years, uh, the crop indus cropping industry has been on the downward trend, and the last four years, the dairy industry has been on the downward trend. Um, and there's no quick fixes. There's no silver bullet that's going to pull us out. Um, but we need to uh, try. I, I think. Uh, in our last session, Governor Walker started uh, Dairy Task Force 2 to look at recognizing that dairy is a $44 billion business, that we need to uh, try to identify things that we can do both in the short and long term. And uh, that report came out two or three weeks ago, and we're evaluating things that we need, that we uh, possibly could put together, but that's where uh, that's where the lobbyists for DBA come, and uh, I'm sure you'll be talking to some legislators this afternoon, all of you, to uh, try to impress on them the uh, importance of certain issues that you believe uh, will make a positive impact on the industry, whether it's driver's card or the UW's hub, uh, or the interdisciplinary uh, um, projects that uh, would help with research and development so there's a whole bunch of different things that we need to do but I think um, the recognition that there is a serious problem that a uh, group came together to develop uh, to look at the problems and to develop action steps to improve them is all going to be helpful but uh, um, you know and, and the industry has changed so much, as I mentioned before. 93 was really when modernization of the Wisconsin dairy industry started. And um, every year, there's more and more changes. And we, when, when we build barns, every barn isn't the same as what it was back in 93. There's always improvements that can be made. And 
new technologies that come through that are implemented. So we have genetics and management that increases milk production by 3% a year in, uh, in the U.S. And, uh, and we recognize that, you know, as we put a big push on a few years ago to get up to 30 billion pounds and it didn't take us very long and we were there. And uh, so we have challenges in that um, we have to recognize that some of it uh, hurts uh, parts of the industry, but you can't stop the global competition that uh, the world brings. So we just have to recognize, to, to, to me, the big issues are employees on the farm, uh, the environment, food <coughs> safety and animal health, land use, global trade, and energy. Those are my top six issues, and um, you know we're trying to work on uh, developing specific policies that might help from a, from a state standpoint. Well, we still do produce the best cheese in the world. That's right. <laughs> my, my daughter is in Tennessee, and she worked for a company called Farm Vet. Now she works for a feed company out of Tennessee, but she works on the farms there. But we always have to send cheese to her because she can't get good cheese down there. Uh, but for, for, uh, for me to preach to you or, or us to even preach to you, we, I, want, I want to hear your thoughts on how, we're, how you're going to diversify and grow. And I, you know, think of, consider hemp. I was here 10 years ago and, and we tried to get hemp um, through the legislature and, and you know, see how slow government can be to, to help make improvements like that. And, and, and of course, I mean, it's silly that we shouldn't have been able to do it then. So that's an example of how, you know, you, we got to listen to you guys. I need to listen to you and all of you here in this room and, and uh, tell, tell me what's the best practices that are going to make uh, Wisconsin dairy, again, the, the leader that it always has been in this country. So just comment on that. Right? Everybody's going to know about hemp. There's a lot of people that are selling the seed. Um, what we go with it? The processing. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. gone to grow this. Uh, yeah. Let's grow it. Let's grow it. But yeah. give me a processing center. Well, I think a lot of that was a natural growth. I mean, the statistic we have 700 <coughs> processors applying through GAPCAP this year. That's a seven fold increase. Um, I know in my particular district, there's a guy wanting to invest a million and a half dollars in a facility in Reedsburg just outside the district. I think we're going to get a lot more of that so that there's localized. Uh, production facilities. Obviously, if there are 700 of them, that's what uh, 10 per county on an average. So uh, that, to me, is really exciting. That we're going to have some small businesses growing in our rural communities again, which is also good for farmers. One key thing for rural development is rural workforce. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, yeah, years back, 10 years ago, when we looked at, you know, industrial hemp. The problem we ran into is there wasn't a marketplace for the product. You know, they had a lot of stockpiled in Canada, but it doesn't do any good for the farmers if you don't have a place to sell the crop. Some of you are probably around long enough to remember the whole Germans from artichoke deal, where this was going to be the saving grace for agriculture. And a lot of it was planted, but when it came time to harvest, there was no place to go with it. So I didn't want to see that happen with him. For the egg community, things that we need to do. We need to look to see if there's any roadblocks in selling our cheese any place in the country. We need to look <coughs> at foreign markets. If they're not utilizing Wisconsin cheese, we need to find out why, and if there's a way we can get into those markets. We need to increase usage, whether it be in our schools, with milk products. And I think a lot of you remember what it was like when you went to school. You got milk every day. Well, that isn't the case anymore. And we need to address that. Uh, in our prison systems, we need to get more dairy products there in places where we do have a control. Um, we need to make sure that the UW is working on things, technology or whatever, that will pay dividends to Wisconsin agriculture. Either make it so that they're able to make a profit at what we're doing, or ways that we can do it cheaper and better. Uh, all those things need to be worked on. And I think that's where our focus needs to be. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I was asking, or beginning to ask sure. about 
Just, just go ahead. Uh, go real on. quick, while we're still on trade, I just want to, and it's not really a question, I guess, but I had the opportunity to go to Washington with a group of dairymen, and I'm a dairyman as well, and, and we got to talk trade, and that was the big topic. And I was really disheartened by our national legislators' inability to get trade agreements through. I just want to comment to you guys that I think going forward, Wisconsin, and we have a strong brand, you know, Wisconsin cheese, Wisconsin milk is a strong brand, but I think going forward, you know, our, our state government needs to be conscientious that it's so important that you guys are part of that vehicle to get our product to the rest of the world because I was just disheartened by our national legislators inability to even get our trade agreement with Canada and Mexico passed in a, in a timely fashion to get us some price relief. So, you know, I just, I think state government going forward may be a bigger part of that vehicle to get our product elsewhere in the world. And I think you guys are on the right track, but I just want to comment on that. So. Thank you. Well, the Department of Ag has been very instrumental in developing um, trips outside the state where the secretary and the governor in many cases made trips and they have that reverse tour where they bring people from other countries into the state of Wisconsin and, and try to sell products. So there's a lot going, there's a lot more that can be done from a state perspective, but at least, at least we're recognizing that there's a lot of opportunities because as I said, they're just, uh, for the population we have here, compared to the rest of the world, we need to take advantage of that. Checking, I'm checking with the audience carefully this time. <laughs> I was going to turn and pivot to the question of ag and rural workforce. Uh, this is a multifaceted <laughs> problem, and we probably need multiple different solutions to help us out. But everything from making sure that young people want to farm or, and have the opportunity to do that if they're just going into it, uh, to how we uh, fill those positions on our farms, uh, not just short term but long term. Again, this is federal government needs to help us on also, but the things that we can do in state to make ourselves a more appealing location to attract and retain talent uh, in both on farm and also in agribusiness. I think a couple of things. I, I had a farm succession bill that I introduced last time. Uh, we have evidence that we've lost a lot of farms because they don't make the transition plan far enough ahead. And I don't know how many of you are in that boat, but I discovered I was in that with my own farm when I started doing this legislation. It's like, you know, the last two years since I did that, you know, I now have a transition plan and the farms and trust and all, all that stuff's worked out so families don't fight over money. Um, and we have the expertise in the Department of Agriculture um, uh, and in our um, extension programs to help do that. What we need is to have people get out to farmers and offer that assistance and why they need to have that assistance. So I think that's one thing that can really help because I know young people who wanted to farm who are not able to farm because the plan wasn't made far enough in advance and we all know dads don't want to let go of that farm until they absolutely have to. You know, they're going to work till 70 or 75 if they can and they want to be in control, but that doesn't help transition for a young man who wants to start a family. Um, and then I think it's, it's also important from another standpoint to talk about what's in the budget and what I think a lot of us are proposing that we need to be able to have your employees, so many of them are um, undocumented and we need to <coughs> provide documents and education so at least they can drive on our roads, they can get to your workplace and you don't have to haul them back and forth or they're not being totally illegal. Not that we need to give them the right to vote or a whole lot of other things and I don't think they're asking for that but we definitely need to get some driver licensing for undocumented that are working here and working on a regular basis on your farms. And we need to we need to actually be able to explain to people because that's the thing I get. A, uh, people will approach me and say, "Oh, this driver's license thing, we can't let them vote." And, but so because there's confusion about that, and we need to make, help people understand that that's not what we're trying to do, and that's not even possible. People need to be registered. They have to have a birth certificate. They have to have so much time, you know, all these things that before they can get the right to vote. This isn't about voting. So it, this has been so dragged out for so long. Again, 10 years ago, this discussion was happening. Let's give driver's license. Why, if we want people, if people are so concerned about who's here, then why wouldn't we want to actually have to 
or have them go through a process of getting a driver's card so we know who's here and know that they're going to be safe on the road. So that's obvious, and I know it's on your list. It's on and everybody's list these days. Um, it, so that's a simple, simple uh, piece of it. And I know it's just a piece of it, but it certainly would help solve some of the problems. I, but to get families involved, I, I just, I've known, all, I, I get tired of this, of uh, hearing people say, well, nobody wants to farm anymore. But yet I hear from young people all the time that they want to farm, that we're not providing the opportunity for them or it doesn't make sense for them to farm. And one of the, one of the issues is, is if this next generation, they can't do anything unless they have broadband access. They can't do anything. And I know even for, for you, you have to take time off to probably, some of you probably do, to go to the library and spend the day just online because you can't do it at home. I know I can't. I only live five miles from the city of Eau Claire. I have to go to town. So it's, we, that's a huge piece of the puzzle, I think, for our future. If we're going to provide for the next generation the access that they have got to have. Any comments from? Yeah, well. When, um, you know, for a long time, um, we had a problem with, um, with having enough jobs in the state. So when uh, Governor Walker took office, we had a 9.2% unemployment rate. Now it's been under three for a year. And uh, so, Instead of jobs, 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 it's workforce, workforce, workforce. And uh, if you notice, my employees were the, my number one issue because it's something we're all concerned about. Um, and we have stuck a lot of money into the technical college system because we recognize that <coughs> we have to have people trained. And I've toured the technical schools now are so sophisticated. And they do such a good job of training uh, people, whether it's soils or animal husbandry or whatever it is. They do such a good job of uh, training people to help us improve our businesses. Um, so that's one of the tools that's really important. Another is the apprenticeship program. I think uh, that's something that workforce development has been working on for quite some time and has been very useful. We've had quite a few apprenticeships that have come to our farm uh, and uh, worked for several months. And uh, so uh, John Young is really passionate about it. And he's working with the Department of Workforce Development to try to uh, improve the program and expand it because uh, it's one of the tools that can have a positive impact on all of us. So those are a couple of the things that have happened. I'm in the realm of uh, labor and, and workforce development, I guess, in a roundabout way. Um, one of the ways to solve that problem is to mechanize things. And one of the things that, I guess, we discovered on our farm when we tried to install robots uh, the first time, and we eventually did get them installed and had more since, is the regulations don't change or adapt for us to do those time, types of changes. And then when the state finally does come along to do things, they tend to overcomplicate things versus what our competitors in the rest of the world does. So then we buy a machine that's made in Sweden or the Netherlands and have to add all kinds of valving and programming changes in order to use that in the United States, even though our competitors don't have to do that. I mean, so what I'm talking about specifically, I guess I can give an example of the block lead block system that the state of Wisconsin was one of the primary proponents of adding to robotics, yet the whole rest of the world does not use. And now the, most of the United States uses it because Wisconsin led the way because we're the dairy state. So I guess um, wasn't so much as a question as it was, I guess, a comment about in order to have solves for issues from a regulatory standpoint, we have to uh, think about what our com competition's doing and how we're going to implement solves that aren't necessarily people. <coughs> Follow me on there. Well, we need, I think we need you to work with your uh, lobbyists to try to develop legislation that might be helpful because in the legislature we kind of address problems as they come up where we don't, it's not at the speed of business. 
I noticed. <laughs> but, uh, but we, you know, we're always looking to try to help and improve uh, the opportunities for the farm population. So we can't we can't keep up with uh, with everything, and uh, but that's why you have uh, some good lobbyists that can help. What area are you from? Green Bay. So your elected people are who? Uh, Cowles and Sankey. Okay. Have you talked to them about this? Sure have. Okay. I, I, I think that's the route to go. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's time that we should probably ask the audience what they'd like to see done, at least on the topic right now. These are, these are your leaders of your agriculture committees. I think this will build on that last question. The parasitic loan of regulatory burden that our businesses go under is um, what has it done? How many hundreds of thousands of heifers are now being raised in Kansas and Colorado instead of Wisconsin? And we're not converting those forages if Wisconsin soils are so adapted to growing and converting that to meat and a, and a live animal here. That's being done in a different state. And when those heifers aren't eating forages, then we're taking crops that were perennial crops and putting them into monoculture type crops because, you know, cows like to eat grass, that's an annual. So regulatory burden, um, you know, you want to go back, Gary, to when you talked about 1993, the beginning of expansion, the end of expansion became regulatory burden. And when it's easier to put your animal on a truck, okay, that also relates to the road issue um, to haul them to a different state to raise them and bring them back. How much economic activity are we missing as a state by doing things like this? And dig into the regulations that are, are parasitic to our industry and try and bring some relief. You know, if you would, uh, I tell this to some people, if you can define the problem and give us some options to solve the problem, then we're a lot closer to getting, you know, things done that you want. So if you're willing to do that, send it to us in an email. I think part of the solution for agriculture is, and I ask of our legislators, is to stand up for us, stand up for us in the court of public opinion. And uh, when we are going through challenges as an industry, whether it's, you know, maybe there's an environmental situation somewhere or a siting situation somewhere, uh, we would really appreciate the back of our uh, state leaders to support their number one industry in the court of public opinion. Well, I, I think the legislature has supported agriculture in a, a whole number of ways. I'm not saying you have, and just you know, keep on the keep on, you know. But I but I really believe that you know, if there are problems that you see a solution to, uh, let us know. Let your lobbyists know. Um, get over to dad cap uh, because if we can agree that this can be changed and this will yield this result uh, why would we do it Holly did you have a question I did I wanted to say I, I should introduce myself before. I'm Holly Bellman with GLC Minerals in Green Bay and when we talk about broadband we're, we've been in business since the 40s half a mile from downtown Green Bay we did not have enough broadband to automate our plant so it's not a matter of going to the library to do something. We, so we can't add security cameras to our plant. And that's definitely true for farms as well. So it's not just the person who wants to gain information or email something or access something. It's really automating your <coughs> business in the farms. We, we put in millions of dollars, 40 this year, 50 this year. Uh, unfortunately, we're behind. And uh, we need broadband across the Northwoods. And it isn't just the egg industry that's calling for it. There are places up north, resorts, that people going there, they usually spend you know, two or three weeks in their summer there. Uh, they're not coming back there because they don't have broadband. They can't be connected. They need to be connected for their business. There's uh, one county right now that's working on a process similar to what uh, some of the counties in Minnesota did, where they combine with their local utility company because they already have the right of way. And they're burying the cable and they're putting in a lot more uh, towers that can be used for wireless. Uh, I don't think there's one simple answer that's going to get us there, but we need to keep on making progress towards that 
And yes, it's going to take more money. And I think we're willing to put the money in. So that's going to be a big part of the will willingness, you know, the commitment from the public. And I'm, I'm, I, I like to always compare, and I, I'm not the only one, that this is the electrification, the new electrification of rural, rural America. And so we have, a, as a population, have to decide this is, what, this is important enough to actually invest in. And I'm hoping co-ops, because I think that they have already the, the clientele and, and, the, and, the, and the motivation to do this. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can really help, um, help co-ops be a, a big part of it. A natural fit. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Go ahead, Tom. Just a comment. The uh, issue of water quality in the state with uh, Governor declaring this year being the year of water, well, I think it's going to be the year of water from here on out, right? Everybody wants clean water, correct? Yeah. Yes. So as dairy and agriculture, we want to be at the table when they're working on the issues, writing rules. We want to be well represented. Uh, Governor Evers was up in Sturgeon Bay a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago, with a group of people, zero agriculture people sitting at the table with him, which you know it was it was more publicity than a than a think tank, but that's one of the things that we're really focusing on this year, and from here on out is being part of the solution and discussion in water quality. We've had some issues in different parts of the state. Uh, <coughs> You know, some some is agriculture will, will own up to what we are responsible for. Another issue is is the rural septic systems. Well, is it an issue of the rural septic system, or is it an issue of poor economic economy in rural Wisconsin that they can't afford to put in a new septic system? So those are all things that have to be discussed. But as as a dairy industry and agriculture, we want to be at the table. I would. Have with you, Ty. My last few years, uh, my last couple of years have been as an activist, political activist, and it's really been around water. The people that I have that I've been organizing for really, it's about water in rural Wisconsin, rural where I come from, and and I think that is the missing component. I think that, and somebody mentioned the uh, the you mentioned the uh, uh, court of public opinion. I think that's huge. I think that's gone the wrong direction. I think there is a misunderstanding from both worlds that uh, that I think in my from my study of history and, and world farming and farmers have have a handle on land and you live it and you live there too you live there with me you got to drink that water those of you who, are, who who do farm your own place so I have confidence that you want the same thing I want. And we and I, I, I totally agree with you. I think that's missing from some. I think some entities don't quite get that yet. And we'll. I'll, I can promise you that I'll be working on, on forcing that to that uh, to come together as to the farmers need to be at the table because nobody knows the land better than you do and how it works. And you need to encourage each other to do that. I was at a a lakes meeting. <laughs> in my district, three lakes that are in trouble and there's all sorts of ideas about how to fix those. I was sitting beside a couple beside a couple of farmers and I turned to them in the meeting and I was over and I said, you know what, if the state gets involved in having to fix this, you guys are gonna get screwed. <laughs> get together and form an initiative and show us that you wanna make progress. And they left there, you know, saying that they were gonna meet and try to figure out what they would do to help. And I. I would just encourage you all do that because if it if the problem gets big enough that you're asking the state to fix it, no matter how hard we advocate, and I do, <laughs> um, the initiatives that you say we're going to fix this, and and we've done some of that, and you know Kiwani County when they got together and they've made some progress, and all of us in every area of the state involved in agriculture need to actively do that and encourage our neighbors to do it as well. Thank you. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, thanks for asking that question because that's my favorite topic. My dad was a soil conservationist for 32 years, and as far as I'm concerned, water is Wisconsin's gold. And we have to do what we can, but as you mentioned, everybody else needs to do their part. Uh, a few weeks ago when um, 
when uh, the egg groups and vegetable growers and potato growers all came to the state capitol, that same day on the fifth, co uh, the fifth page, there was a four inch column that said, Milwaukee sewage treatment plant yeah. has discharged 281 million gallons of su raw sewage into Lake Michigan. And so, um, so we have to, I think, look at things on a watershed basis because there's a big difference from the karst area and um, cracked bedrock <coughs> and the central sands and southeastern Wisconsin <coughs> with the nit nitrate problems and the new products that are problems that are coming out. So we've got to look at things, and last session was the first session that we passed legislation that didn't affect um, the state as a whole that was site specific NR 151 which dealt with the 240,000 acres in southeastern Wisconsin about 15 percent of the land base that has the karst problem. So I think we have to look at things on a watershed basis and if there are places like uh, Madison where Madison, Milwaukee, Shawano, Wisconsin, my area where there's a lot of cement and blacktop that water is going to go somewhere. And a lot of uh, people like to have pretty lawns and they might put a little too much fertilizer on and have that run off. So it's all of us working together because there's a lot of problems out there and you get just, you got to get rid of that habit of picking on big ag and saying you're the problem because it's all of us. Thank you. And with that, we're going to break for lunch here. But first, I would hope you can all join me in thanking our panel.